All right. This, if you missed them all, this is a good one to be here for. <laughs> this is one of the most misunderstood things in the church today. If you misunderstand this, somewhere in the church there's legalism. And the biggest one that we're going to hit on is, the, uh, is a Christian Sabbath type of thing. Um, so the, the Old Testament, it's, it's strange that they call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. The word for testament, it should actually be Old Covenant and New Covenant. So right off the bat, it's a little confusing. So the Old Testament is an Old Covenant which was with the Israelites, period. It does not extend into Christianity. There are tons of things that were extremely important and are repeated in the New Covenant for Christians. But it was given specifically to the Israelites. It was a covenant between God and the Israelites. Jesus fulfilled it. And the Christians have a different set of covenant. It's a different covenant that covers much of the old covenant, but it's different. So let's get right in here. We're going to go way back here. So the first laws or the commands actually goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And uh, can anybody think of what some of the commands were that were given to, to Adam and Eve? Put everybody on the spot. Don't eat of the knowledge of, uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen. That's one of them. We had uh, be fruitful and multiply, dress and keep the garden, and don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's it. That's all that was given to Adam and Eve. Laws of Noah. So after the flood... Everybody's dead except for Noah and his family. Um, a, a new set of laws was given out. Similar, be fruitful and multiply. Don't eat flesh with blood. Before this, they, they basically were grain, fruit, and vegetable eaters. It doesn't necessarily say that they didn't eat animals, but it doesn't say that they did. So it's an unknown. But at this point, they're allowed... To eat animals, God actually put the fear of man into the animals. The animals scattered. So from that point forward, but when they ate flesh, it was not to have the blood. And when it says eat flesh with the blood in it, it's not, not that you have a juicy steak. It's actually the literal drinking of the blood as if it was a, a drink. So that's what that's about. It, it's not a problem with having a steak with, with blood in it. And don't murder. So before Noah, Adam and Eve weren't told don't murder. And if you go back to Cain and Abel and that whole thing that took place there, it was all handled in a strange fashion. Um, that the blood cried out from the ground and that, that Cain wasn't killed. He was marked and he was sent out away. And it, so it's a very strange thing. We can't comprehend what, what life was like before the flood. There was something totally different there. People lived to be almost a thousand years old. Whole different thing that I really don't think we can understand what people were like, what living was like, what was going on back there. A whole different, almost like it was another planet. It was a strange thing that took place there. Um, and then after Noah was the law of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Um, we don't know much about this. Um, the laws that were given to Abraham and, and the patriarchs. We do know there was something. Genesis 26, 5 says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Uh, so there was something there that was given, but we just we don't know what it was. Um, and the patriarchs were saved through faith, just as we were. It's strange, a lot of people think that in the Old Testament the Israelites were saved by following the law and doing the rules, but they weren't. They were saved by faith, and they did all these works because they, they were in a covenant and they were commanded to do them, but they were saved by faith the same way we are. Okay, so this is a strange phenomenon. This is, there was another, at the time of the, the patriarchs, at Abraham's time, there were kings in the area, Samaria and, and um, Assyria and different large cultures around the, uh, the golden or the uh, fertile crescent. And one of the main laws was known as the Code of Hammurabi or Hammurabi. And it was a king of the time 
And it was, uh, he was a Babylonian king, and it was uh, supposedly this law was given to them by their sun god called Shamash. You can guarantee this had demonic things involved, and this, there was something bad that took place here. Um, it was followed extensively by the people in the area, including the Israelites to a great extent. And it had very strict punishments that were later eased by the law of Moses. So this was the, the general law for the area for quite a while. And then came Moses. Um, so this is when, when the Old Testament is talking about the law. It's this. This is the Mosaic law. This is the law that they, they had to the, the, you know, rest on the Sabbath. They had to go to the feast. They had all the priestly, the Levites and the Aaronic laws. This is the law. So we can forget about those older things in, in Eden and with Noah. This is what we're going to focus on from this point. So uh, this was given specifically to the Israelites in the Old Testament. It's... Uh, recorded in the first five books in the Old Testament called the Torah, it's some, some people call it the instruction. Uh, it's really one big book that was split into five parts. The whole thing was written by Moses. Um, we have Genesis, which has those earlier laws, the Edenic, Noahic, and patriarch, uh, patriarchal laws. We have Exodus, where the Ten Commandments is first given. Leviticus, which is the priestly laws. Numbers is the people or the social laws. And Deuteronomy, Deuteronomos means second law. It's not actually the se a second law, it's just the, the law being told a second time. So uh, Deuteronomos, second law. So the Mosaic law consists of two main pieces, which is the Ten Commandments, and then there were 613 other commands. There were 365 negative commands that say, don't do this. There were 248 positive commands that said, you need to do this. These are the things that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they stretched these out to extremes and they yoked the people and just, just drove everybody bonkers with their, their foolish interpretations of these things. Uh, this, these, the Mosaic Law can also be broken into moral laws, which is basically the Ten Commandments, social laws, which were referred to as judgments, and also ceremonial laws, which were referred to as ordinances. So why was the law given? It was given uh, to give the people knowledge of what God considered to be sin, it was not given to show people what they needed to do to get to heaven. It was actually the opposite. It was to show people that they could never do what was required by God to get to heaven. You know, the, it talks about at the base of Mount Sinai when the law is given to the people. And uh, God makes it clear that this is going to be a covenant with you and your, your children and your future generations. And... Nobody, I mean, if, if after the list of things, the 613 commands and everything that God listed out that they had to follow, you would think there would be some people going, no, 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 I'm good. I, there's no way I can follow that. But they, they didn't. They said, yes, we'll do this. And they, got, they went into the covenant with God. And that is what locked them in. And there's so much more that can be said about this. The Israelites were... were a, uh, stiff-necked people. They, they weren't chosen because they were better. They were chosen because they were stiff-necked people and God wanted to choose them. And there's something different here that goes on too because the Israelites had a relationship with God the Father. It, Jesus wasn't around yet. This was God the Father. And Jesus came, the, the pre-incarnate Jesus showed up a couple of times in certain circumstances, but in, for the most part, this was a voice from heaven, from God the Father, that was in commune with the Israelites. So they, the Israelites almost have a, a marriage covenant with God the Father, whereas Christians have a marriage covenant with Jesus. It's a very strange phenomenon. It's, it's, we could spend hours just talking about that. But, so this was to show them that they could never do what was required by God to get to heaven. But they didn't get that. They thought that they, they would be able to do these things. 
Uh, so it was impossible for anyone to keep the law perfectly except for Jesus. Uh, and it was a law, it's referred to as a law written on stone. And this was a shadow of the law that would be written on our hearts. So at this point with the Holy Spirit, we have the law as written on our hearts. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law was to give knowledge about what God considered to be sin. So well, let's look at the Ten Commandments. And this is a different way than you've probably seen. And, and this is the key to the, the whole rest of what we're going to talk about. Um, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's possessions. So the, the w reason I had it broken up that way is that the first three apply to loving God and our relationship with God. The last six apply to loving others and our relationship with others. The fourth, now this is, this is the key and this is the confusion. Rest or be killed. Now make pretend that we, we were Gilligan and we just crashed on a desert island and we're, we're going to be there for the rest of our lives and we need to set up laws. So we set up, you know, no killing, no stealing, no committing adultery. And then somebody says, well, we need to rest on Saturday and if somebody doesn't rest, we need to kill them. Everybody would go, whoa, whoa, wait, you know, hold on a minute. That's a little extreme. You know, if they're tired, they can rest maybe. maybe you know, it's good to have a day of rest. That's fine. But, but if they don't rest, are you going to kill them? So this is pretty, di this is very different. And mo this is why most people misunderstand this. This was such an important thing that death was tied to it. So why was it so important? And we'll, we'll get into that. So... Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the Sabbath day is the seventh day. It's Saturday. It's got nothing to do with Sunday. The Sabbath day is Saturday. So that's very important to understand that as well. Most people think the Sabbath day is Sunday. It has nothing to do with Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week in the Bible, always. Um, so Sabbath equals the, the Hebrew word Shabbat. It's a rest or ceasing from work. It was the seventh day of the week, Saturday, uh, when God finished his good and perfect work. This was a free gift from God to the Israelites. So God was giving them a gift. This commandment also intercedes between God and man. So if you look at the list of Ten Commandments, you have God's commandments, man's commandments, and then the fourth commandment splits them. It intercedes between man and God. So the Israelites' view of the Sabbath, um, they, and this is what they believed, and, and to a point, it, what they believed was true, but they were, didn't get it. They didn't know Jesus was coming. They didn't understand what was, what was going on, really. So their view was a normal human reaction to what was taking place. So they believed it was to show the people of other nations that the God of Israel was a good God and he loved them. Um, they, uh, they found that they only had temporary physical rest. So they would work for six days and rest for one day, and then they'd have to start working all, all over again. So it was just a temporary physical rest. And that they could never have spiritual rest from sin. The priests worked every single day, including Sabbaths. They never rested. So they, they and this took time for them to, to realize and, and understand what was going on here. There was no seat in the tabernacle of the temple for the priest to sit down, only the mercy seat for God. So there was only one seat and they weren't allowed to use it. That's kind of neat. Hebrews 10, 11, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Just a sidebar, 
the whole thing with the animal sacrifices was animals are amoral creatures. Animals can't sin. They, they, they have been given no commands. They don't have anything beside instincts. They, so animals can't sin. So they were, their blood was acceptable for a temporary covering to sin. It was only temporary, and it's just a strange sidebar that, that animals can't sin. So it's a, that's why their blood was okay to cover and um, uh, cover sins for certain, certain types of sins for a certain amount of time, and you had to have a certain animal to cover certain things. So it was got into this whole Levitical priest laws and it got very complicated it was and also it was a bloody mess i don't know if anybody hunts or or has gutted animals but these priests were all white and they if you've ever seen a butcher in the back room the butcher's clean compared to what these priests look like at the end of their shift. These, this was a bloody disaster. Constantly killing full-size bulls and lambs and sheep and goats and complete mess that we don't understand what was going on here. So a whole, whole different thing going on here than, than you kind of think. So this is the key. The Sabbath was assigned for Israel. So Exodus 31, 13 to 16. So this is God speaking to Israel. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off. That means put to death from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. God wanted to make sure this was clear. Therefore, again, he makes it very clear, this is only to the Israelites. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout the generations as a perpetual covenant. So it's very clear, and this is the misunderstanding, is that people think that the Sabbath is brought forward into Christianity and that it's been changed to Sunday. Not in any way, shape, or form the case, and we'll, we'll get into that further, but... This is some very clear verses to make it clear that this is to Israel and it's a sign. And we'll see later that it's also a shadow, something that, uh, that's a shadow of what is to come with Jesus. So that's the Israelites. Now let's take a look at what, what, what um, Christians have to do. We are under liberty. We're not under the law. We have freedom. We have the Holy Spirit within us, and we have been given liberty by the work that Jesus did. So Jesus did the work, and we got the gift. We got the liberty. Liberty is the quality or state of being free. And Jesus from, uh, read from the scroll of Isaiah in the temple, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So, and if you go on, the, the, the freeing the captives and uh, those who were oppressed was tied to the law and to sin. So they were oppressed by the law, and they were captives of sin. So Jesus did all the work necessary to end the law and to remove our sin if we accept him as, as Lord and Savior. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Galatians 5.1, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And the yoke of bondage again is a law. So for Christians, Jesus said, uh, Matthew 5.17, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus was the only man who ever lived that was able to completely fulfill the entire law. When something is fulfilled, it is brought to completion and ended. 
Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So it's only what Christ did, the work he did only covers people that believe, to everyone that believes. So, so what happens? So, I mean, there's still under some commandments. We have a covenant with Jesus. We did the new covenant, the New Testament. So we're not under the Ten Commandments. Now, and this is where the confusion comes in. And I, I would guess from what I've seen, 85 plus percent of the churches in this area and in the country believe that Christians are under the Ten Commandments. And they are totally incorrect. They completely misunderstand what's going on here. And unfortunately, it's because... I would guess from what I've seen, 85 plus percent of the seminaries in this country don't teach this properly. So the Ten Commandments were part of the law, and we are not, if they want, if somebody wants to go into a courtroom and take the Ten Commandments off the wall, I have no problem with it because we don't follow the Fourth Commandment. We follow the other nine, and that is where we're going to focus and see what ha what's going on here. So Jesus gave us two new commandments. So um, a lawyer uh, asked Jesus, uh, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Romans 16, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And it also speaks of liberty. So grace and liberty. So the great commandments, so let's look at this. this is, it's the, and this is the coolest thing, too. The way that, it's, I mean, God's not messing around here. This, it all makes sense, and it's all really incredible how this works. So the first part, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This covers the first three of the Ten Commandments. That, with, that's our relationship with God. So just that one sentence covers those three commandments. If we love the Lord then we don't create false idols, we don't, um, we don't use his name in vain, and we have, have only one God. So there's the first three commandments are covered. Second part, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This covers the last six commandments. Just a simple little statement. All six of those commandments are instantly covered. If you love your neighbor, you won't murder him. You won't commit adultery You're with his wife. You won't covet his, his things. You won't give, bear false witness against him. So these two commandments cover nine of the ten commandments. Boom. So there we go. So... <laughs> What about the Sabbath? And then we're back to the Sabbath again. And this again, this is an important twist here. So the real meaning of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a shadow of the true rest that would come through Jesus Christ. This is why it was so important and why God had death tied to, to blowing off the Sabbath. If, if the Israelites ignored the Sabbath, it's the same as us ignoring Jesus. So this, it was just a shadow that Jesus did the work and he has created the rest that we get to enjoy. Um, this was not made known until after Jesus had died and was raised from the dead. The Israelites at the time of Jesus were completely confused out of their brains. They didn't know whether to turn left or go home. It was so confusing to them because they had been under this law for so many hundreds of years. And it was so dangerous to go against the law. Their politics were centered around the priests and the temple. Very confusing time for the Israelites. And Paul, most of the letters Paul wrote were because of the Israelites trying to mix the law back in with Christianity. So we rest every day. We, we, if you want to say there's a Christian rest, yeah, we rest every day in the work that Jesus did for us. We're at peace knowing that we don't have to do something to get to heaven. We have rest. 
Hebrews 10, 12, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So he finally did something worthy of sitting down. He was the priest that sat down. It's the coolest thing. Matthew 12, 8, Mark 2, 28, Luke 6, 5. For the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. So this is actually Jesus saying it. He said it in all three Gospels. It was so important. He said that he is the Lord even of the Sabbath. So he is the commander of rest. He's in complete control of rest. So um, this is what I had just mentioned, that the Jews were trying to merge the law with Christianity. And again, this was a confusing thing. It, would be, it was highly expected that they would do this. And that's why they had people, strong people like Paul, that had to go around to the churches and straighten them out and go around and go around and go around and keep straightening them out. So Colossians 2, 16 to 17. These verses that we're going to do here are key to understanding that we're not under the law, that we're under liberty. So Paul, um, there, were, there were Jews that were trying to mix, tell people that, yeah, you're, you're a Christian, but you still need to follow the festivals. You still got to rest on the Sabbath. You got to eat certain foods. So they were mixing it in uh, all together. Uh, and Paul said, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. They had more than just Saturday. They had other Sabbaths that they celebrated during feasts. Um, so all of those things are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So if you go back, if you, especially if you study the festivals that the um, Israelites had to uh, follow they all point to jesus there are all these little stories of jesus it's the coolest thing it's i mean it, it's just incredible the amount of symbolism that's wrapped into the old testament and everything points to jesus and the work that jesus did, was going to do at that time so all of these things that god gave to the israelites were a shadow of what jesus was going to do Romans 14, 5, and 6. This is another biggie. One person esteems one day above another. So some, some people think that a particular day is more important than another day. Another esteems every day alike. So some people think that every day, yeah, it's just another day. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. This is the biggie. So we're at liberty. If, if we want to rest on Sunday, rest away, have a ball, go stay at home, do nothing, Fine, that, but understand that that is your choice because Jesus gave you the liberty to make that choice. If you don't want to rest any days, if you've got a nice even kilter, maybe you work part-time and you work four hours a day, seven days a week, so, so you're fine with that. It, we have a personal relationship with Jesus. We, we need to be accountable to Jesus and we, we need to work on our, our gifts and we need to try and put out spiritual fruit and the Holy Spirit is constantly convicting us. Some people have convictions about certain things and other people don't, it doesn't convict them at all. So each person is affected differently. Um, you know, you have the whole Roman Catholic thing about don't um, eat, uh, only eat fish on Fridays. You remember that? The, the, yeah. Well, Sue, my wife, had her, has a grandmother that used to do that. And Sue said, you know, you don't really have to do that by the Bible. And she says, I know. I just I got used to it and I like to do it now. And she's good. It's like, well, fine. If that's what you're, you understand that you don't have to do that, but you choose to do that, that's great. So there's nothing wrong with that. So this is basically saying that there's no special days with festivals. Those are holidays, basically. Christmas, Jesus wasn't born anywhere near December 25th. He was born in September sometime. And it's actually easy to figure it out. Not easy. A little bit of work having to do with the priests, 
having to do with John the Baptist's birth and a couple of other things. You can figure out within plus or minus about 25 days he was born in September. Nothing to do with December. The December 25th has to do with satanic, the winter solstice and sun god worship and a whole bunch of other really bad stuff. So if you don't feel like celebrating Christmas on, on December 25th, there's no problem with that. That's not a Christian holiday. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we need to celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th. Also, Easter whole similar story. Easter is closer. They got the date closer there, but that has to do with a whole nother set of, of uh, a pagan god called Aster, and it has to do with fertility goddesses, the eggs and the rabbits. It has to do with fertility. So it's all, all these holidays that people think are Christian holidays have nothing to do with Christianity. And again, it doesn't say to ever celebrate the day that Jesus was resurrected. It says when you do the Lord's Supper, it's to look back on that. But it doesn't say that to, to celebrate a day like Easter. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. We don't celebrate Christmas and Easter because we're worshiping the sun and, and fertility goddesses. So there's nothing wrong with us doing that. But it's important that we understand where these things come from. And it, it, not to make a big deal out of these things. Some people get so bound up in these holidays with these expectations and misunderstandings that it turns into something not good. So there are no festivals, no Sabbaths, no food or drink related issues, and certainly no moon related things for Christians in the New Testament at all, nothing. Um, we just have, we have a personal relationship and the Holy Spirit convicts each individual person in a different way over different things. So liberty is a huge responsibility. So don't be a stumbling block to others. So Romans 14, 13, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Uh, follow through with your conviction. So, well, let me, let me just stop at the stumbling block. So basically what this is saying is that um, I, I don't, I have a nice even keel. I don't, I rest, you know, if I get tired, you know, I like to go on little vacations. Means that we don't have jobs where we're working in a sweatshop and we need to, oh man, it's, you know, it's the weekend. We got to rest. We enjoy doing stuff. So we have a nice even keeled life where we don't have to worry about setting aside a day for rest some people may work six days a week and they may really bust their hump and have a rotten job and really kill themselves all week long and they get to sunday and they want to take the day off it's uh, i better be careful that i never go over there and harass them and say come on man you don't have to rest today let's go do something that's putting a stumbling block by judging that someone's doing something that you're comfortable with and they're not doing what you're, you're doing. Um, that's where the, the legalism and the stumbling block occurs. Is that that's, if they want to rest, that's none of my business and I'm not to ever try and change them and tell them that they don't, you don't have to rest today. It doesn't say you have to rest. He has the liberty to rest and I have the liberty to not rest. So that's the stumbling block is to try and force your liberty on someone else. Also, the following through with your convictions. This is the personal relationship. So Romans 14:20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil, evil for the man who eats with offense. 14.23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is from sin. This is a little confusing. What was going on here is that they were talking about food and that there was a whole bunch of foods that they weren't supposed to eat pork, for instance, that they weren't supposed to eat pork. So 
God had told them it's fine, you can eat pork now, but a lot of people were having a real problem with that because they'd been, it was just not part of their diet. It was almost to the point, it, um, the best example I can think of is people from India can't eat cinnamon. They eat curry, but they, never, they don't have cinnamon. Cinnamon makes people from India apparently violently ill. It's such a strong spice and it has never been in their diet. Just to smell it can make them violently ill. So that's what pork was like to a lot of the Israelites. Just to smell it made them sick and they had a real problem with it. So what this is saying is that if you're convicted that you shouldn't do something and this example was food so you the Holy Spirit has convicted you you shouldn't eat pork you go out and this years go by you haven't eaten pork you go out with someone and you you go to breakfast and there's bacon cooking and everybody's eating the bacon and you go oh man I don't know if I should eat this everybody else is eating and I'm gonna eat a piece and you eat a piece you have actually sinned you have because you broke your own convictions and it was so difficult for you to do that you are going against what the Holy Spirit wanted you to do or not do strange thing that this personal relationship so each of us has certain things that if we're convicted by the Holy Spirit to do it or to not do it we need to try to stick to that which is a weird thing and it may change over time again that the, the Holy Spirit is doing it for a reason um, it, it, you know it's, it can be strange things like uh, if uh, going to a bar I mean, there's, there's nothing sinful about going to a bar, but if you go to the bar and you get drunk, then, then that becomes sin. But the Holy Spirit may know that you've got a drinking problem, and the Holy Spirit gave you the power to stop drinking when you became a Christian. You cold turkeyed it, whatever happened. You haven't drank for years. So the Holy Spirit may put on you, don't go to bars. Dude, that's your own personal conviction that the Holy Spirit has put on you because the Holy Spirit knows if you go to a bar, there's a chance you're going to see everybody drinking, you're going to smell the alcohol, and you're going to get drunk. So you need to be careful to follow through with that conviction or it actually becomes personal sin. These are strange things, and there's a million examples of this, and it's all a personal relationship issue. So this is a, the summary of, of what this is. So there is no day of rest commanded for Christians. We can rest if we want. Beyond the two great commandments, we are at liberty to do whatever the Holy Spirit convicts us to do. We don't have to rest on a particular day or eat certain things or participate in certain holidays or feasts. If an individual wants to rest on a particular day or eat certain things or celebrate a particular holiday, is free to do so, and that becomes a personal conviction. If someone purposely breaks their own personal conviction, that becomes sin to them. And we are never to push our own personal convictions onto others. That's legalism. And that's, that's the, the crux of legalism, is us pushing our stuff on other people. Um, and it just, it's a messy thing. Um, legalism is a messy thing. You go into some churches and everybody's wearing a suit and tie or dresses. And yeah, I don't know if anybody's seen that. I've seen it a couple of places. And if I walk in a door of a church that everyone is dressed up in suits and ties and wearing dresses, I will quietly leave as quickly as possible because that's that I, I I'm there's a 99.9% .9 chance that is a very legalistic church they all believe that they're making God happy because they're, they're dressing up if there's a few people wearing dresses and a few people wearing suits fine that those are personal convictions I got no problem with that you want to wear a suit have a ball but when everybody is doing that that is a is a red flag flare being shot off that there's some legalism issues here um, so, and it becomes such a, a ritualistic yoking thing that people 
think that, that God loves them more, that they need to do this and they need to do this and this and this, and God will love them more, and then they check off the religious box for the week. So it's such a dangerous thing when legalism creeps in like that. The, the rest on Sunday thing. We went to a church that was legalistic, and, and we were first saved, this was years ago, first saved, and legalism is so dangerous to a new Christian because it makes sense. You're a new Christian, you haven't read the Bible for jack squat at this point. You just know that Jesus is real and you're saved and your life, things are bright and shiny and you go to a legalistic church and it, here's the rules. Here's the, you know, you gotta rest on Sunday, you gotta get dressed up, no doing work, you know, you gotta fall, fall. Here's the rules and we went to a legalistic church and it seemed right and we fell right into this and you, you start, I can remember seeing people coming out of other churches that weren't dressed up and saying they, they don't get it. Look at them. They're not, they don't even love God. They, you know, they're not dressed up. Well, horrible, horrible thoughts and things. And the, um, the rest thing that and it, it started to, the Holy Spirit started to move us. And we were in the Word. We started to read the Bible, read it more and more and more. And we were there for about six months. We had read through basically the whole Bible at that point. And the Holy Spirit's pointing stuff out to us. And we're starting to ask them questions. And we're like, well, what do you mean we got to rest on something? You know, we want to go out and go hiking. We want to do something, you know, at the time. And uh, they're like, oh, no, no, you got to rest on Sunday. That's a, that's a Christian Sabbath. And I'm like, well, show me. I, you know, we just, we're just about done reading the Bible for the first time here. You show me where it says that I need to rest. And they kept going to the Old Testament and pointing to Isaiah. And the, you know, they had some of the verses that I showed you. That, that you will obey my Sabbath so you'll be put to death. And we're like, wow. And we didn't understand at the time that the Old Testament and the New Testament were different. Old Covenant, New Covenant. We didn't get it, and we looked into it deeper, and I started poking around on the web and researching this stuff, and, I, and the Holy Spirit just kept pushing us and pushing us and pushing us, and excuse me, the Holy Spirit kept leading us and leading us and leading us, and the, amen, we followed him. And he showed us these things, and he, he showed us Dallas Theological Seminary, and he showed us people like Dr. Constable and Dr. McGee, as Dr. McGee teaches this properly. And um, when you hear someone that understands it, teach it and pull it all together and show you that we're not under the Ten Commandments, especially because of the Sabbath, and that Jesus is our Sabbath. We rest in the work that Jesus did. It's all of a sudden you're like set free. And we actually went in and we met with the leaders of this church and we have brought our Bibles, we had all the verses laid out and we explained to them what basically what I talked about here tonight. The, this, the older man, it was an elder man and his son, they were the church leadership and that's a red flag <laughs> to, to begin with. <laughs> Nobody else was any, there were no other leaders, no deacons, no nothing. Um, but uh, the old man, got, he got furious at it. I mean, he really got upset that we were trying to take away his works. And we found this. We spoke to other people in the church, and they got upset with us. We were giving them the truth. And it was the strangest phenomenon that we were taking away their works. And they wouldn't give it up. They didn't want, that was, they were so bound to doing that work that they didn't want to give it up. And that is the danger of legalism, is that people get bound up in this, in this work. So anyways, that's my two cent story, but it's, I've seen it firsthand, um, the, the legalism thing. So common examples of legalism. Everyone must rest on Sunday. The key word here is obviously must. You want to rest on Sunday? That's fine. Or one day a week. Some people start playing this game where they shift it around, that they, they turn it into this wishy-washy commandment thing that, uh, that they, as long as it's one, and I've heard someone say it, God has a cycle of six and one and six and one and said, mm, you're missing it, you're missing it. 
So they, they turn it into this wishy-washy. As long as you work, uh, you rest one day a week, it can be any day, then you're all set. No, that has nothing to do with physical rest for us. Everyone must get dressed up to go to church. Everyone must wear hats or dresses. Have you ever been in a church where all the women wear hats? The strange phenomenon. And it's a misunderstanding of a verse about women needing to cover their heads. Um, everyone must read the King James Version of the Bible. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Great translation, but we speak normal English now. There are other translations that are fine. Everyone must go to church every Sunday. This is another one. The, and the Roman Catholics get into a whole other issue here. The Roman Catholics have actually changed. The Roman Catholic Church is actually the Jewish priestly configuration perverted and turned into Christianity. They have priests. They have an altar. They have confession you need to have someone a priest in between you and God you're not allowed to go directly to God in a Roman Catholic Church you always have to go through their priest through confession um, so the if you look at the Roman Catholic Church for point it's actually Judaism but it's perverted it, it's a very strange phenomenon it's all satanic it's it's just an awful thing and um, they make it, they turn the, the, the Sabbath day, they changed it to Sunday, and they, it's a sin if you miss church. If you're a Roman Catholic and you've been put, put into the body of the Roman Catholic Church, it is a sin for you to miss church on Sunday. Absolute heresy. So, oh, this is kind of, this is interesting. Uh, just a final thought. When a person is not familiar with the Word of God and tries to be religious by setting up their own rules, they're almost always stricter than what God wants. It's a strange phenomenon that takes place. If you follow what God says, God's yoke is easy. But if you don't read the Bible and you try and set up, you try and guess at what makes sense, you're almost always stricter than what God wants. So it's a cool thing. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And you'll probably remember this one. Um, excuse me. Genesis 2, uh, 16 and 17. And God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day, uh, the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Later, when Eve was talking to the serpent or Satan, um, she repeated it but she got it wrong she said and the woman said to the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the trees which is in the midst of the garden God has said you shall not eat it nor shall you touch it otherwise you die so she made it more difficult and it's like come on Eve you know it's and it's just funny that that is the prime example that if you if you don't read the Bible and know what God says, you'd always err on the side of being more strict on yourself, which is just a strange phenomenon. And yeah, I think that's it.